Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with me, Christian Harris. My guest today is Ian Cook of Nibosh. Uh, Ian uh, has been working in the education, health and safety and business fields for a number of years, and he's really passionate about education, learning, development and training. And that's the topic of today's podcast all around training in the field of health and safety, what's been going on in the past, uh, what are the current trends, how's Nibosh supporting that, uh, there's a new product or a new service that Nibosh have just launched and uh, we delve into that as well. Uh, and then what's the future look like? So we get into uh, augmented reality, uh, micro learning and various other things as well. Uh, really enjoyed this chat with Ian, uh, thoroughly nice guy as you'll hear uh, or, or see if you're watching this. And um, certainly if you're in a corporate, I'd recommend checking out the Nibosh endorsed um, service, which we will link to in the show notes. Let's get into it then and join my conversation with Ian. Cheers. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success Podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms and video versions are available on YouTube. For now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Thanks for joining me today, Ian. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks, Christian. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, good. Good to good to get you on. Got some interesting things to talk about. Um, so, so start to start with then. Um, why do uh, SHE professionals need quality training? What's your view on that? Uh, well, I think anyone who's uh, involved in work whatever their discipline needs to have appropriate and uh, challenging training that sort of pushes your knowledge to ensure that you have the correct um, information to apply when when you're at work. Obviously, the skill of uh, someone is applying that information in the right situation, but having the information in the first place is a key component. So I think training plays an integral part of people's development in that area. Mm. And um, the broader the qualification sometimes, the, 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 the more challenging they can be, the more information people can take away with them and then learn how to use that. Nibosh obviously prides itself on having qualifications that are not just broad, but also targeted within specific hazard areas and, and yeah. particular industries. So I think training becomes um, an individual's choice about how they might go about that. There's a lot of different ways people can study, but essentially the transfer of information and knowledge uh, is vital to a successful she manager. Mm -hmm. I often use the analogy of a general practitioner doctor whereby if you're going to the GP, you know, they need to be able to recognize and diagnose all manner of, of problems. They won't necessarily have the expert knowledge to sort of necessarily treat and solve that problem straight away, but they need to be able to recognize it. And I always think that is a great analogy for what a health and safety manager needs to be able to do in, in their career. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely spot on there. That's a great analogy. And I think recognizing that limit of knowledge in some areas is part of competency. You, you cannot be an expert in all areas. And that's where it's such an interesting field um, because you can ne really never know it all across the whole spectrum. But, but just having enough information is interesting and can be, um, it keeps it fresh, really. So, yeah, that's a great analogy there. Yeah, I agree. You can steal that one if you like. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> So, so over your career, because you've obviously delivered a lot of training uh, as well, um, have you got any good examples where, you know, sort of there's been a, a best practice approach that's really worked, that's, re that's really excited or, or impressed you that you could share? Or, or, or I suppose, conversely, any sort of horror stories where you've kind of gone into an organisation and found that actually the way they've been doing it in the past has been kind of very archaic and, and not hugely effective? And, and how has that been turned around? Yeah, quite quite a quite a lot of both ends actually, unfortunately. But um, I think if I start with the the challenging piece first, I think some companies feel that training is a tick box exercise. And I know we all say that, um, but what does that actually mean? I think it's just oh, we know some people need some training. Let's send them on it, and actually not spending the time. The company this is not spending the time to look through that content. Maybe sit on the course, and actually look at this and say, is this up to date? Is this reflective of what we're doing today as a business? Um, you know, there are examples where you might have had a training program running for years using an old document that's no longer mm. actually used in the business. And that means the learners disconnect with the training almost immediately. They, they sit there, they see the trainer, they look at some old pieces of paper that think this is not reflective of what I'm actually doing. So they kind of lose faith in the training almost immediately. 
Um, and that's a challenge. I get it in big businesses with large numbers of staff to constantly update every record. You know, if you're updating policies and procedures in your big system, then actually considering the training that people are getting might be an afterthought. Mm. So I think it, it is important to make sure that content is truly reflective of the real challenge. And actually sometimes not having too much in there is better. So a, a positive of that is actually simplifying the training to be more effective on two or three key points rather than trying to pass over tons of information within a short session because we know as humans that people just can't retain that volume of information. Mm. So I think a good training session is, is targeted, concise, and then for those that do want that further information and guidance, then there's a, an opportunity to get that, maybe not, in, not necessarily in that classroom on that day, but at a later stage. And that's how you then get the learning to be embedded back into the business further down the line. Mm. So I, th I think there's some negatives and positives mixed up there to hopefully answer your question. But one thing I'll finish on, and for me, the number one positive from a trainer is to tell a story. So whatever your challenge is, whatever it is, whether it's uh, manual handling, fire, chemical safety, the ability to convert that into a real life applicable scenario and then tell the story aids memory. It, it allows people to, to understand the, the logic to what you're trying to teach and it allows them to walk away. And if they can just remember the story, then the detail follows. So I always try and break every learning concept into stories. Um, it's a simple method, but I find it works. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting because um, we've got an upcoming episode with a barrister. And I was asking him, because I've, I've already recorded it. Um, I, I'm not a sort of predict, predicting what's going to happen in the interview. I've already done it. Um, but we were talking about how to be in the best position to defend a claim, you know, in, in court, whether that's a civil or a criminal case. And <clears throat> two of the key points he said were, having a good story um <laughs> but, but but also um when it comes to health and safety policies i asked him you know is it better to have a the world's best policy that you've put huge amounts of time and effort into and it's hugely detailed and it ticks every single box and crosses every t and dots every i um but it, it's almost unachievably good or is it better to have something very short snappy simple that you know is going to be implemented and he said oh absolutely the latter so it's interesting that you you're look coming at it from the same perspective absolutely absolutely because i mean um one of the things within law that a lot of people maybe overlook is the fact that you've got a safe system of work in place and a risk assessment but if it's not reflective of what you actually do that that's no defense uh, in a court whether that's a policy a risk assessment a safe system of work so if it is over complicated and people aren't actually following the process then yeah it's not worth the paper it's written on you've, you've ticked a box again but in terms of defense if it's not understood by workers then it's not achieved its objective mm. i mean some companies have actually moved away from paper-based policies and procedures and moved to more video learning and more interactive ways of communicating those messages mm. as long as the message gets across and then is followed i think that that's where enforcers are going to test you on as an employer really Mm, yeah it's interesting you mentioned that that, that shift because the next thing i was going to ask you about was kind of the trends in terms of the changes of how how training's been delivered mm. over over the years so you know have we moved from a very sort of academic you know lengthy very detailed you know here's a big manual bible to read um through to more interactive stuff now i mean what's your perception of, of that I think we have in some essences. I mean, it's such a broad spectrum education that, you know, it's good to have a variety of methods because it suits different people. So it, it, there isn't one always size that fits all. But I think you're right. There is a shift, even at the higher level, the very theoretical level of education. Chunking that information into smaller consumable pieces is not just good from a, a design perspective of how to get that information to someone from a training perspective, like it could be a, a video vlog or, or a, an infographic backed up by a huge manual, as you say. Um, but if you chunk them into two areas, it's easier to manage that. Mm. But that also applies equally to a simple message or a lower level training qualification. So I think those principles apply across the whole range, really. And yeah. um, the changes, the evolution for me, I, I, humans haven't changed we still have two ears we still have two eyes you know we still we still have the same senses and we still learn through the same methods but the the mechanisms how we get information to people have changed and evolved mm -hmm. so i think it's a lot more creative now and i think it's a huge positive a huge positive because um i was involved in some of the virtual classroom deliveries over the last few years and a lot of people were very anti-e-learning mm -hmm. um, because of the effectiveness and the engagement but actually when you've got a tutor in a video and an interactive session people were finding actually that 
they enjoyed it and they were getting some of the benefits of a classroom okay it wasn't always as good but in, but in many cases it was it was comparable but the benefit i found which was amazed by learners who would usually be very quiet and shy in a classroom had the opportunity to be involved in polling and quizzes and questions online mm -hmm. and they really found that they could engage more and actually as a tutor i saw more responses from the from those maybe quieter members of a, of a training room uh, on a virtual classroom basis there was more engagement from them and they pos they they really did feedback that they found it more um they found more they had more confidence to be involved if that makes sense mm. yeah that's very interesting um yeah because it, there's lots of sort of hidden benefits of, of this shift yeah. that we've yeah. seen that, that you don't often think of and i wouldn't have thought of that but it makes as you say it it makes kind of perfect sense to me I think for me, it's the combination of um, those methods and it's choosing the right method for the message you're trying to get across. So if you're doing a very high level theoretical piece, then maybe having a lecturer in a lecture style is, is suitable. If you're doing something obviously practical without the theory, that's a skill or a physical, then obviously practicing it and doing it on the work. So I think it's choosing the method that best gets across the content that you have to give really and i know that sounds a bit of a woolly answer but that's why it's it's important the people who are delivering it are competent in designing training and delivering it <laughs> yes yeah no, absolutely yeah i suppose the one shift that i would maybe su suggest is is maybe that um we we struggle with focus perhaps as much as you know we used to i think so everybody's attention is very uh you know up for grabs and and everybody's so busy and non-stop and so actually having that maybe totally slightly, sort of crisper crisper sort of training is is, is there's a benefit to that because it's more digestible and more uh, likely that people will actually do it totally agree and i think let's be honest we've all been on face-to-face -face training where it finishes at three o'clock based on the fact that everyone expects it to and people's attention spans struggle after that amount of time yeah. um, and i think if you go online with that if you try and replicate that sort of longevity of time in a classroom online it's even harder for people to stay focused so um i think you're right the way people consume information now is fast it's quick it's in and i think you have to kind of replicate that the future generation of learners coming through now will expect content to be almost like what they see on their phones they want yeah. that sort of engagement that wow um yeah, uh, that's a challenge to the profession of uh, trainers and educators because they've got to keep their content fresh and engaging. Um, so, yeah, I, again, agree. I think that goes back to my point earlier, I think, about the content being more micro and bite size in chunks mm. and also the ability to then tell a story because that story can evolve the content as well and yeah. bring it together. So if you have got a lot to get across, the story can tie it together, really. Mm -hmm. I mentioned this book in a podcast uh, uh, recently, last week's podcast, I think, with, with Jill Dixon from Gerald Eve, but there's a, a book I like. It's called Seven Stories That Every Salesperson Must Tell. And it gives you frameworks for telling stories which are really good for engaging people. And I think actually in a training environment, that mm. works that works very well uh, too, is, is having those, these kind of frameworks of stories and giving examples. I'm making examples a note of that one to, now, Christian. To, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, to, to sort of bring it, uh, bring it to life a bit. So um, I know a couple of people sent me messages on LinkedIn after the the podcast saying oh yeah I've, I've bought the book so um be interesting to see if they had a spike of spike of orders from the from the from the safety professionals in the last couple of weeks yeah i mean it is that's so true it mm. is it's just it's it's the ability to engage and inspire people with information isn't it and pass it on and if, yeah. it, with a safety professional it's hard because sometimes the information is very factual and you do have to stick to kind of you know data standards laws regulations and it's quite hard to jazz that content up but if mm. you can and create scenarios or characters or, or aware of case studies you mentioned legal aspects earlier if you can bring it to life through real case studies where humans have fallen foul or or put in things that have protected people well then that that can yeah. inspire people to think oh yeah this is a real thing it's not just some numbers on a page no yeah definitely so you're you're in your sort of second spell with with Nibosh now. Um, how how does or how has sort of Nibosh historically helped then in this in this regard? You know what have what what has Nibosh traditionally done in terms of a role to to support with training, and then um, how has this kind of developed over the years that you've been involved up to up to this point? Yeah, well, I think traditionally Nibosh has been. Um you know, involved heavily within education, as most people will know, that's what we're kind of synonymous with. We've developed a range of qualifications that have had broad input from HSC, the regulator, um, to other regulators, such as Office uh, Office for Road and Rail, uh, local authority and industry. 
So many people contribute to the content that goes into NEBOSH qualifications, plus our learning partner network, which is uh, very extensive globally, our examiners. So therefore, it's, a, it's always had a great network of people that contribute to the qualifications and the type of content that should be in there. You know, what are the challenges safety professionals are facing? And, and, and therefore, I think the syllabuses are, are fantastic. I would say that, I suppose. I've always been mm -hmm. proud of my time with NEBOSH and proud to be back here again for a second time. I think where NEBOSH is now, it's evolving into the sense of, there are other things that we can do and it's recognizing these shifts in learning and so there's other things we can do particularly with corporates who are a key stakeholder within NEBOSH's world because they recognize NEBOSH quals as being fit for purpose and people who hold them as being competent and, and well qualified so actually can we do more with corporates on the softer side hence my corporate services uh, launch recently where we're trying to develop in company training approvals for corporates where they're looking to develop learning impact mm -hmm. and i think that learning impact is really important for corporates so um it's it's an area we're going to expand into we're going to do more we're going to keep looking at edge tech what, what services are out there and we're going to try and help corporates not just deliver large qualifications for individuals but actually look at softer training across the court across the piece for larger number of his employees yeah yeah in terms of learning impact then how how would you sort of measure or, or, or quantify that or are, or are some of those um some of those impacts less less sort of quantifiable and more qualitative yeah some are qualitative and some are quantitative i mean you do get um challenged on this area by by practitioners because it's a hard area to measure but but if you can show there isn't a change an effective change where learning has shown to improve or impact upon performance then there is a measure there that we can use to show there has been a positive change mm -hmm. um, some of those might be qualitative some of them can be quantitative in terms of uh, lost time injuries or you know inspections or behavioral changes in terms of uh, compliance observations and things like that um, but the, the key thing is it's not to overcomplicate it it's a mm -hmm. bit it's a bit like the training analogy we spoke about it, it's actually being very clear about what it is you want to change and then choosing one measure to show that that change has taken place or been influenced by the training and if that's a positive influence then it's a positive story yeah um and i think sometimes people try and do two or three measures or they they can overcomplicate things or sometimes i did have a comment um recently i hope the person not listening doesn't recognize this but but it was a good one we had a laugh um I, I mentioned that actually a manager should check the learning has taken place by observing workers in the workplace and they said oh we'll have to check you know that's a, that's a change in role for the manager i said no no supervision's a legal requirement managers mm -hmm. do have to check their workers are doing it so it's just part of their day-to-day -day. Um, it isn't something new they should be doing so there are different measures it doesn't always have to be through assessments tests and quizzes it can be through observation as well mm -hmm. yeah and i suppose actually the really important stuff is are, are they people that have had the training living and breathing and doing it rather than necessarily if they passed a, a test because if the you could pass a test and then not actually implement you know the stuff couldn't you exactly and, and i think that's where there's this place for this in the workplace it's this softer learning impact where you can look at actual workers changing the way they work or actually complying with them. And, and just trying to reinforce that just improved numbers even if you only affect um 10 of workers like a compliance putting a safety hat on it's it's still better than it was and therefore, you know, actually, we see an improvement or a risk reduction within the business. Insurance companies recognise this. They see learning impacts as a way of reducing and pre uh, reducing a premium. Yep. So um, it's certainly mathematically proven. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think it's something that people often forget that uh, insurance companies, you know, would 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 rather have uh, uh, lower premiums and lower claims. Um, you know, as long as they get their margins right, then that's fine. Um, so, but uh, they'll often work with you to, to try to improve safety outcomes. So it's always something that a bit of a hidden secret that people over, overlook sometimes. Exactly. And it's not an absolute, you know, we can't say that after this training, no one's going to have an accident. No. You know, we, 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 that's not, that's not realistic. No, that would be nice, wouldn't it? If you could, it if, would. you, if you could guarantee, you know, do this and then you'll have no, no accidents ever again. But yeah, as you say, um, not that's it. And, and most people familiar listen you know most people familiar with safety listening to this will know the yeah. bradley curve and sort of the cultural piece and the behavioral piece and how you squeeze that last bit of safety out of performance yeah. and, and i think we are there and therefore the techniques we're going to have to apply now to really get to zero if that's the true goal then they are going to have to be innovative they are we're going to have to recognize there may be some fine margins was it david 
David Brailsford for Team Sky yep, that talked yep. about you know Cycling, yep. marginal gains, uh, very small marginal <laughs> gains. Really, could spend weeks and hours, I suppose, just trying to shave a millisecond off off, off a race time. Uh, it, it, we may be at that stage within safety now. In some companies who are very culturally mature, have mm-hmm. invested millions into physical controls and campaigns, the, the gains might be quite small for some of the investment. But, but we can show that there is a possibility to improve further. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, with that in mind, then, I was qu- particularly keen to, to get you on to talk about uh, Nibosh endorsed. Um, would you want to give us a quick overview of, of what that is, how it works, um, some of the benefits? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, Nibosh endorsed is a service where Nibosh can approve in-company training or campaigns that look to improve safety performance. So it's an ability for a company to have already an existing program. They may have um, one that works really successfully, but would like that external recognition. So Nibosh can endorse that program, put a logo on it, um, help work in partnership with them to communicate the benefits. And obviously the company gets a lot of benefit from demonstrating to their staff they've invested in this. It's a serious program and they can externally promote that to any shareholders or stakeholders that they're working with Nibosh to improve health and safety performance within their business. Mm -hmm. We can also help uh, corporates in the sense of if they don't have an existing program, we can help design it from scratch. And this is where it's very interesting from my perspective, because designing it from scratch can mean that we really consider learning impact from the very beginning. We we Mm -hmm. can focus in on what they're trying to achieve. And with our network of um, partners that we have, We've got some great experts all around the world in in pretty much most of the industries you can think of. And we can bring that expertise along with uh, solution partners in edutech and learning design and bring those to the table to really give a world-class solution to a corporate. And I, I, I'd like to think, you know, we're really trying to be cutting edge with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's the plan. Um, we're quite flexible in how the content is is brought to us. It can be, be anyone out there, as long as it meets the certain criteria and the strict criteria we have around learning impact and the quality controls we'd expect for a good, good learning program. Otherwise, we're very flexible. We just want corporate to have that opportunity to badge their in-company training. Yeah, yeah. So they're trying to scale scale up the impact, I suppose, and, and get yeah get in front of a bigger, a bigger audience in, in some different sectors and different companies. That's it. And we're offering sort of, you know, free consultancy um, at the moment to companies that are interested in this, but don't quite know how to go about it. Um, and it's quite interesting talking to companies. They don't always know what measure they really truly want. They know mm-hmm. they want to improve behavior. So they design a great behavioral safety course. But actually, okay, let's just focus back on why are you doing this? Why mm-hmm. are you running a behavioral safety course? What was, what was the reason you decided to do this? And actually then trying to make sure that is the reason we're doing. And then we can measure that at the end of this program. Yeah. And it's, it's it's an interesting conversation. I'm really enjoying my work at the moment. Yeah, so it's quite quite a new thing. It's, it was launched, what, a week a week or so ago? It was, yeah, yeah. It's uh, well, It must be, at the top of my head now, it must be about 10 days old. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, was it 25th of April? If I should remember that date. <laughs> <laughs> Probably been working to, towards it for a long time. But how's, how's it been received so far? Yeah, the feedback is excellent. You know, I think people can see what we're trying to do and you can see we're doing it for corporates. This is a service focused purely on the customer. It's all about the customer getting something what they want. Um, and obviously where Nibosh will, will gladly support our learning partners in helping their customers as well. So it, it it's very altruistic. I think it's very mm-hmm. charitable. Um, and I think it's trying to do the right thing. So from everyone's feedback so far, it's very positive, really. Oh, okay. Glad to hear it. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it, it's always best to have the, the customer in mind when you're when you're creating a, a solution or a, or a product or a service or something i think quite often people get caught up with well we do this and exactly you know, this is what we can help with and actually not thinking necessarily about as you say going back to the basics here what are we trying to achieve why are we doing this from the customer's yes. perspective and let's empower the customer the hard part of that then is marketing it because to ch- the challenge is then communicating that if you've really looked at it from the customer's perspective and there are lots of different customers out there then how do you get one message to go back out once you've launched it? So it's been a challenge on the communicator, but hopefully what they see is a sim- the simple simplification of it is we will endorse your internal programs and training. But how they get to that, they could already have an existing course that they just want us to look over. And if it meets that criteria we've just said, yeah, great, yeah, that's fine. we'll endorse. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. Great. Well, that's very, very exciting. And hopefully yeah. uh, some of the, some of the audience will, you know, lots of the audience are coming from these corporate backgrounds. So, um, you know, perhaps they'll reach out and, and have a chat with you about it. Fingers crossed. 
Yeah. Uh, um, so lo- looking forward then from from here, um, do a bit of a bit of um, scar gazing. Um, what what do you see? You know, the next sort of 10, 15, 20 years in uh, developing, like in terms of um, health and safety related training. You know, are we going to be going to be doing everything on VR headsets? Are we going to be doing? <laughs> are we going to be doing sort of like micro, micro, micro learning where we're doing 10 second, uh, 10 second TikTok <laughs> videos? I mean, how do you see that going? Uh, good question. Yeah, I mean, I think micro learning will continue to evolve. I think it's probably a little bit uh, horizontal now. I think we've got a lot of the technologies out there. It's probably utilizing it more. I don't think we've really explored all the technology we currently have at our disposal today. Mm. I think safety from my experience, I was involved in education uh, before I came into safety. And I'm afraid to say, I think safety is four or five years behind uh, educational best practice Mm. in some of the other industries. So if we wanted a short term view of the future, we could look into, you know, corporate training for yeah. leadership and finance and uh, in some cases, HR and L&D best practices to see where safety will probably go next. To look beyond that, I, I, I've got a sneaky feeling, I think gamification is going to be becoming more powerful as mm. the cost of developing games comes down then it's a bit like the story I was telling. If you can immerse somebody into that story and get them to be in the story and then make decisions as they progress through the story on their own by learning it. And, and some of the tech I've seen actually can decide if someone's a very good learner, very strong learner, the choices they get are at this level of learning. If they're not so good, uh, or if this is a new topic to someone, then the, the information presented to them is part of education and teaching them to get up to that. And the next time you play it, you're at the high level. Mm. So I, I, th- I think that that logic to it, you, you can't do that in a classroom. And I'm not saying the classroom will have no place in the future. I still think classrooms will have a huge place in the future. But what you'll probably do is have a few days in the classroom, meeting your colleagues, doing practicals, having a chat, seeing humans. Way. <laughs> but then you'll go away and do this kind of gamification type interactive stuff in your mm. time, in your, in your own time, consumed when you can, really. Yeah. Some of the stuff I've seen, uh, only limited amounts of it, but some of the stuff I've seen around um, virtual reality and augmented reality yeah. and, and some of the headsets and, you know, and all that stuff is obviously expensive right now. But if you think of, you know, a flat screen TV or a, or um, you know a, a laptop or whatever, and you think how much that would cost ten years ago versus now. You know you you can get a massive flat screen TV for four hundred quid nowadays, whereas it was probably four grand, wasn't it, ten years ago? So I think Absolutely. That, all of that stuff will start to become more accessible. One of the VR companies I've been talking to, um, who we work with, they're experts at what they do. A lot of um, very high risk type scenarios that they recreate. They actually post the headsets out to delegates and groups. Mm. So um, the cost is really a postage and packaging cost and they've yeah. got a really good um, fix. So there are, there are ways around these things. I think you're totally right. And again, it goes back to, is that the right method for the learning? If it is, then there is, there's often a way to get that sort of experience across. Sometimes I've, I've designed part of Endorsed actually, one of the pilot programs. One of the pilots um, on day three, I think it is, they're all going to attend a local session in a, in a set location and have actors and VR and a bit mm. of stuff. So it, it's part of a bigger program. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's exciting. Yeah, very exciting stuff. Um, yeah, be, be very, very interesting to see how this continues to, to progress over, over the next few years. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, health and safety certainly wants to keep evolving in that area because, Mm. um, you know, we have to stay relevant because businesses will look at the value safety adds back into the business and the effectiveness it gives really, not just as a a tick box, but actually from a quality perspective, from a performance perspective, from a lost time perspective. So the more engaging, the more uh, value we can get back out of this, the better it is for the industry as a whole. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. And fun, funny enough, uh, this this coming, I, I don't know if you know this, but I run every Wednesday like a, a safety roundtable, <clears throat> which is a Zoom session <clears throat> and um, where we, you know, get 20, 30, 40 people and just chat through a topic. And, and this week we're going to be talking about um, what I've coined the four Ps of proactive safety and risk management and that's all about how do you demonstrate what the what are the benefits you get from being proactive and doing it properly and how do you sell that into the board and and all that stuff so yeah i think you're uh, you're spot on with with that analysis yeah i mean that is the the people are talking a lot more about risk and opportunity now and mm. i think from when i you know i'm so young obviously but when i started in safety 15 20 years ago it was all risk it was always negative it was red on a risk assessment table yeah, yeah. now we're talking about 
opportunity, which is a different concept, isn't it? And it's how you balance that risk and opportunity. And as a safety professional, that's quite a challenge for them to, to look at it that way. Yeah, it is. It is. I think that uh, it's interesting because if you look at sort of SHP, for example, they post out on LinkedIn and, and Twitter and everything every month, you know, these are the top most read articles and they're always the fines, the serious incidents, you know, so, so it's, it does seem like <laughs> within the industry kind of looking in sort of in an insular way, we're still focusing more on the, the red side of things uh, yeah. than the green, but you know, I, I'm sort of all about trying to, uh, that's one of the reasons to do the podcast really is to try to sort of share some of this positivity and try and get people to think a bit bigger and a bit sort of more profoundly about you know the benefits of, of getting it right absolutely and i think you can turn it on its head so instead of like three by three on a risk assessment nine and we know 25 is worst could could we not say actually the positively that we're controlling that to a 16 mm. so well done to the company you're actually you're actually 16 but you could be better there's an opportunity yeah. to be 20 24 if we've got to have one on a score sheet obviously so there's an opportunity to improve it by this and i think turning that round can help the mindset a little bit to play yeah. on numbers but <laughs> no i think that's it's certainly it's interesting because um you know thinking about in my in my business you know engaging and influencing and trying to get people to to, to take action in the world of slips trips and falls um nobody wants to hear you're really bad at this yeah even if, even if they actually are nobody wants to hear that like what they want to hear is yeah you're doing pretty well but here's some here's some ways to to improve even further or here's you know let's let's we're, we're doing yeah, we're, we're at a good level let's try and aim for a great level um, exactly. so i think yeah, that's yeah. you know it's always important to to try to put yourself in like we said about building your um your your new endorsed uh, product with the customer's needs in mm. mind it's the same mm. kind of thing here isn't it you're mm. who are you trying to influence put yourself in their shoes um, what do you want to hear what don't you want to hear what's going to actually prompt you to do something or what's going to prompt you to think oh no i don't fancy any of that that's, yeah yeah you know, yeah yeah um so yeah very very interesting very interesting discussions to to have and i think that's the modernization of a safety professional isn't it mm. i mean i think it felt if i just go back to some of my early days when i wasn't really qualified or competent in safety but i used to meet some people who are very qualified there was this kind of cultural thing that i felt and and i could be wrong but this is just personal opinion it felt as if safety professionals were like no no you can't do that and then when someone in the business would say well well okay we can't do that but then what can we do? And it's like, not my job to tell you that. I, I, I just tell you, you can't do that. Um, and then people would be like, well, thanks then. Yeah. Uh, it, was like, it was like business prevention unit, wasn't it? Um, so I think that evolution of a safe professional and being an enabler mm -hmm. to help the business get output, improve its reputation, see the positives, see the opportunities whilst managing the risk, being yeah. aware of the risk. I mean, they're, they're, I suppose they'll always have to focus on the red side sure. to an extent because that's what they're paid to do. But mm. um, it, it is being aware of the opportunity as well and balancing the risk, isn't it? What, what appetite for risk does the business have really and how can mm. you make it safe? Uh, yeah. One of the CEOs actually of Nibosh Past said something to me, uh, which I'll never forget. Safety allows you to do things. Mm. And that's simple words, but that's so true. Yeah, yeah. Now that that's a great way to finish the finish the podcast. I think that's a very strong, very strong message. I like that. Um, so if if people want to, well, firstly, thank you for for sharing your time and, and giving us the updates. Um, if people want to learn a bit more, what's the best way to uh, get in touch with you? Um, is it sort of LinkedIn, for example? Yeah. Or what's the best way for you know for people to find out more about uh, Nibosh endorsed and and sort of more on Nibosh generally? Yeah, sure. So um, for me, uh, yes, please connect on LinkedIn. Uh, Nibosh General will have our website. And if you're interested in the corporate services that, um, that I'm working on and some of the things we discussed today, we do have a corporate services page specifically on the Nibosh website that will talk you through those things. And that's okay. probably the best way. Yeah, perfect. Well, we'll get we'll put that link, um, that specific link into the into the show notes as well. So, you know, just in case it's hard to find. I know I know some websites are... <laughs> it's quite hard to navigate around them so um, we'll, we'll, we'll pop that in all right Ian. well thank you very much really appreciate it very, very much enjoyed it i think you know some interesting topics and some great um things for for people to ponder on uh, so thank you very much thank you um and thanks for joining us uh thanks for joining e and i and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week for another episode of the podcast cheers thanks for joining us on the safety and risk success podcast if you've enjoyed this episode, please hit follow and do share on social media. Does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest, even yourself? If so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.